Ladies and gentlemen, as patroness of the Josiah Berlin Days in Riga, I'm delighted to greet you here tonight at the sort of concluding grand event of a day that has been very exciting and interesting from the very start. I'd like to express my appreciation to all those who have participated in organizing this and also my thanks to those admirers of Isaiah Berlin who are faithful to his memory and who attend these events year after year. This year we have been particularly privileged in the guest speaker who has accepted to give the Isaiah Berlin Memorial Lecture at the Isaiah Berlin Days in Riga 2014. President Ilves is a man who embodies in his life cycle so many of the upheavals that Europeans, among others, have gone through in their lifetimes, longer or shorter as the case may be. He was born after the war, but his parents had left because of the war. They had left Estonia, uh, and probably I um, we should maybe ask him about how this happened. Uh, so many went across in fishing boats in under very dangerous conditions. He was born in Stockholm, but obtained his higher education on the eastern seaboard, having grown up in Leonia, New Jersey, which is an interesting place because some Latvian leaders also uh, happened to have lived there. Obviously, it was a place that welcomed immigrants from across the ocean. Many young people, when they are looking to the choice of career, wonder before entering university, what would be the best preparation for an ultimate political career? It was understood, I remember when I was a youngster in Canada, also being a child of Latvian exiles in this case, uh, that it was taken for granted that you had to go into law and that a background in law would make you most fitted uh, for an eventual political career. Well, I'm delighted to tell you that that is by no means the case anymore. There are other uh, forms of training which turn out to be extremely beneficial to those who have received them because a number of them have wound up uh, taking the head of their countries as head of state. President Ilves is one of them. Uh, who got a master's and a bachelor's in psychology. And I uh, may be prejudiced in that regard, but I think that having basic training in psychology makes you singularly prepared for all the challenges that life may throw at you uh, later on. Professor Ilves was at one point involved actually in teaching Estonian uh, language and literature. Simon Fraser spent some time in Canada and I remember as a president-elect of the Baltic, how is it called, the Association for the Advancement of Baltic Studies, um, that we were looking for an editor for the Journal of Baltic Studies, and uh, his name prominently came up as a promising young scholar who would be helpful. Uh, unfortunately for us, he did not stay uh, at Simon Fraser very long. He was called to Radio Free Europe uh, in Munich, and eventually became not just the researcher, but the head of the Estonian desk at that institution. And those of you uh, from uh, this side of the former Iron Curtain will know that the broadcasts of Radio Free Europe were awaited very anxiously by a great many people here, in spite of what in Latin was called the sawing, that is the electronic interference uh, to these radio transmissions. Uh, President Ilves was one of those people who kept up this link with the free world, thus providing Estonians with access uh, to objective information, information that was other than what they were being constantly fed in a controlled way uh, in an authoritarian society. Uh, mind you, they did have access as well 
uh, to Finnish television, which made them so uh, apt and interested in learning the Finnish language. Uh, but I think that Radio Free Europe played an extremely crucial role, and you might say that this is one way of fighting for liberty, uh, where uh, the pen and the voice were mightier than the sword. When uh, Estonia became independent again, uh, President Ilves was named ambassador to the United States and Canada. And knowing these countries well, uh, could acquit himself of this important position, of course, uh, with great skill and great brilliance. This drew him to the attention of politicians back home, and he was chosen to be Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, on two different occasions, uh, again with the thought that here was somebody who was singularly well prepared to present Estonia to the world and to do so uh, in a fluent, uh, coherent and witty manner, uh, which always left an impression. After serving as a member of Estonian Parliament, he also served as member of the European Parliament. And so you see that in the very short years of Estonia's independence, he went through a whole plethora of high office and political responsibility, which by his birth uh, abroad uh, and his moving across the ocean, by normal probabilities, one would not have expected. But fortunately, uh, probabilities allow us for shifts and breaks uh, in existing systems, and we in the Baltic countries can appreciate how important it is uh, to have such opportunities to seize them when they come and to make the most of them when the opportunity is given to us. President Illes was elected president of Estonia twice. He has been re-elected and enjoys great popularity in his own country and abroad. He's a man who does not tolerate fools gladly and does not always hide it. Uh, he is a man who speaks his mind and also does not hesitate to do so, but he will always do it with wit and humor and with an original approach and with uh, original details uh, that never cease to amaze you. Ladies and gentlemen, we are extraordinarily privileged to have with us tonight the President of the Republic of Estonia, Henrik Thomas Ilves. Paldis, 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 paldis. Labakar. That's the extent of my Latvian, at least in the beginning. Let me just say, I'm glad uh, President uh, Freiberger mentioned Leonia because that's where uh, Uldis Grava was from. I remember chasing his VW down the streets, main street, because he had a bumper sticker that says USSR out of Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania. And I was hard to believe that there was someone else in this little town that actually would have a sticker like that. But anyway, when I was honored to be invited to give the Isaiah Berlin lecture here in Riga many months ago, I knew what I wanted to speak about. The changed understanding and new views of privacy since exactly a year ago today. The Guardian published its first story on Edward Snowden. Um, it shook at the time and has continued to shake our understanding of the liberal democratic order, of what is permitted to the state and what is not. Um, and I shall return to this talk today and spend the bulk of it, but then I would be the proverbial ostrich here, especially in Riga, the city of Isaiah Berlin's birth, if I were not to talk about more fundamental issues of liberty uh, which are at stake currently. So I will have to talk about those as well. Basically, I agreed to come here to talk about one thing. Meanwhile, after I agreed to come to talk about one thing, something else happened. 
in Ukraine and to come here and talk about privacy and not talk about Ukraine would be really stupid. On the other hand, I would be lying to you if I came here having promised to talk about privacy and talk instead only about Ukraine. So I'm going to try to bring them to the two together and I've managed to justify this intellectually by saying, well, I'm talking about attacks on the liberal democratic order from the outside and from the inside. I hope that satisfies you intellectually. Anyway. A quarter of a century ago, and this is also hard to believe, at least for me, that it was so long ago, the world order, the status quo of the preceding near half century was beginning to shift and about to collapse. In fact, today is another anniversary. Today, June 4th, 1989, was the day that uh, Poland had its first almost democratic elections almost democratic elections because in typical fashion as a result of the Polish round table uh, the communists were given one-third of the uh, seats a priori that's kind of a commie election um, but in spite of that in spite of the preset positions that were given to the communist candidates in the hope on the part of the communist party in Poland that they would uh, manage to maintain power they lost because the two-thirds, or almost, were taken by Solidarność candidates. So today is another anniversary that this was the beginning, the real beginning, of the restoration of democracy in the communist world, and it was exactly 25 years ago today. But back then, before the 4th of June, 1989, the world was, at least from the perspective of everyone concerned with this area of the world, was bipolar, consisting of liberal democracy with market economies, which were found mainly in the West, and on the other side, against us, were, was illiberal autocracy combined with collective ownership, sort of summed up in a word as communism. That was mainly in the East. Of course, in terms of world population, most of the world was too poor to be considered part of either whence the now rarely used term third world. We've gotten rid of the term third world, but, uh, and we no longer have a first and second world, but nonetheless, we do have a certain polarity. This neat, at least at time, or at least in plastic order, was beginning to crumble 25 years ago and would soon collapse. And as I said, the first semi-democratic election in Poland 25 years ago today was one of the milestones of what we then thought was an irreversible march to liberty. Also in that year, in 1989, an American, then at the State Department's policy planning staff, Francis Fukuyama, published what must be considered one of the seminal essays of the late 20th century, The End of History, later expanded to a book of the same name, arguing that the ideological debate between liberal democracy and authoritarian and communism was over, and more importantly, that liberal democracy had won, and won forever. Fukuyama, it is important to note, did not say liberal democracy had won in the real world, that everyone had embraced democracy or would embrace democracy, but rather that the contest for ideas was over that no one, no one could any longer claim the superiority of an authoritarian regime. At that time, of course, the Soviet Union had yet to collapse. Riga was still an occupied city and an illiberal regime of autocratic rule backed up by KGB thuggery still reigned here. Yet this too was soon to collapse taken by us as more proof of Fukuyama's Hegelian or perhaps neo-Hegelian view of history and the victory, the inevitable victory of liberal democracy. Today, of course, we're a bit smarter. 13 years after 9-11, which was one event, we see that 80% of Russians support annexation through military aggression in Crimea 
We see that uns the unschluss of territory is justified by, simply by the presence of co-ethnics. And moreover, there is, a wide, there is widespread support for an anti-liberal attack against permissiveness, be it in the freedom of speech or choice of life partners. Indeed, indeed, we see that liberal democracy has not only failed in the battle of ideas against authoritarianism, but it has failed even to prevent the resurrection of that, what we thought was a vanquished demon, fascism. Not what is the Ukrainians are accused of, but rather what we see going on in Russia. And moreover, even worse, we see that not only areas in the East do we see where a generation, in fact, has grown up since the end of communist rule, but even in such previously safe bastions of liberal democracy as Western Europe, which should know well enough the demons of fascism and the ideologies of hatred, these same ideas are gaining new currency. And we saw in the results of the recent European parliamentary elections how well a number of basically, ultimately, fascist, pro-authoritarian parties won in Western Europe. So what went wrong? Why is it that today everything seems more, even more insecure than during the Cold War, when at least we had agreed upon rules of international behavior regarding what countries may or may not do? Part of the answer, I think, lies in another essay that later became a best-selling book, also became a best-selling book, Samuel Huntington's The Clash of Civilization, that appeared four years after Fukuyama's essay. Huntington saw future conflicts in the post-ideological age to be ones between cultures and civilizations. And all of this seemed to be verified by the 9-11 attacks motivated as they were by a religion-based antipathy tw toward modernity. This was more fundamental, uh, this is a more fundamental kind of, uh, I would say, nationalism in a sense, religious fundamentalism as a form of nationalism. Recall that nationalism, as uh, Isaiah Berlin has pointed out, had its root actually here in Livonia when uh, Johann Gottfried Herde and Garli Merkel began their I I explorations of the idea of the folk. Uh, they came here and discovered that there were other cultures. This was an amazing discovery for, from Germany, but there were other cultures. Um, and that they had their own source of culture. Um, and this actually led to uh, a revolution in German thinking here from Riga and environs. Later on, Fichte picked up on this and turned it into sort of a more, more advanced kind of nationalism that perhaps doesn't excite us as much. Um, but we can say, though, that um, the out-of-control nationalism uh, that led ultimately 150 years later to fascism was at least in, rooted in some kind of common cultural heritage that Europe could recognize. But civilizational conflict was something we really didn't get. Uh, it was something that Europe had not known since the Crusades. At least we, seeing it from the perspective of the victorious West, did not understand civilizational conflict. We just saw it as a civilizing, civilizing path. Um, not that we ourselves didn't engage in, in civilizational conflict, be it China, the colonization of the Americas, Oceania, or Africa. But we are so infused with our Kipling-esque civilizing mission, so messi messianically convinced of our moral and intellectual superiority over those other people, that we never thought of it as a civilizational conflict. There was no conflict. It was simply Kipling's white man's burden, civilizing the, I quote, fluttered folk and wild, your new-caught sullen peoples, half devil and half child. 
But now, with 9-11, we were challenged on our own ground. In New York, in Washington, in, in terrorist attacks in Madrid, London, and Bombay. All of those challenged the liberal order, attacking inter alia democratic elections, the equality of men and women, the separation of church and state, the rule of laws, and not men or God. Now, until recently, it seemed that this was a revolt against modernity, against the disruptions of globalized capitalism. We thought, however, that on our own continent, the wars of the 20th century, the defeat of Nazism, and the collapse of communism had settled, as Fukuyama maintained, once and for all, the primacy and Hegelian ineluctability of the triumph of liberal democracy. As we have seen, it hadn't. Ideas such as territorial annexation based on co-ethnics abroad that we last saw in 1938 with the dismemberment of Czechoslovakia and the Anschluss of the Sudetenland, these were ideas that we believed were settled for good on May 8, 1945, but turned out they were not. The prohibition of aggression came into effect with the UN Charter, also from 1945 stating that members shall refrain in their international relations from the threat or the use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of any state. Then came the Helsinki Accords of 1975, in which the transatlantic countries, from Vancouver to Vladivostok, agreed not to use force to change borders or challenge the independence of any state, to regard one another's frontiers as inviolable and to refrain from making each other's territory the object of military occupation. No such occupation or acquisition, according to the Accords, would be recognized as legal. I'm just quoting from the Helsinki final, I mean the Accords from 1975, signed by the USSR, the United States, later on by us. Basically, we all agreed to this. And then, of course, there's the 1990 CSE Charter of Paris for a New Europe, in which the signatories of all the then members fully recognized the freedom, I'm quoting, the freedom of states to choose their own security arrangements. This basically, is, these documents that I'm just quoting from were the, or have been, and some people still think are, the basis of security in the modern world. All this was done, actually, in the liberal spirit of Immanuel Kant's perpetual peace, an essay from, 19, from 1795. And in fact, aside from the inter internal market, the intellectual foundations of the European Union, as well as of NATO, ultimately rest on Immanuel Kant's essay. Kant believed in what was what has two century later, centuries later become our dominant foreign policy mantra. Republics, that is today, democratic states based on rule of law, who form a federation do not wage war against one another. The European Union has since its origins in the coal and steel community in 1951 amply proved Kant's thinking to be correct. What we have not dealt with, however, is, that, is what we can do with countries that are outside the federation of democracies. We can all agree among ourselves that we're not going to go and invade, shoot, and do all those other things that Europeans were so famous for for thousands of years. But, but what about the other ones? They're outside. By and large, that has been our problem. We have extrapolated from Kant and the experiences of the European Union to believe that tied to a lattice work of agreements, countries will not engage in aggression, forgetting that in the case of the UN, the CSE, OSC, and numerous lesser treaties, Kant was right, but offered no solutions on how to get along with despotisms and tyrannies. In fact, that was his whole point. Dem democratic states do not engage in aggression. But we, we went too far. We thought, okay, just a state will not engage. We don't understand that despotisms and tyrannies behave differently. So ladies and gentlemen, we live today in a completely new security environment. 
and we really do, because none of the rules apply anymore. In this radically new situation, the liberal democratic West is still looking for answers or failing to agree on what those, what those rules or answers should be. We do not know still how to react. What we must realize, however, is that once the rules of the Helsinki Accords no longer hold uh, in regards to only one signatory, the entire situation has changed. This is not an East European issue. Ukraine is not a faraway country we know nothing about, to quote British Foreign Secretary Neville Chamberlain when he agreed to allow Adolf Hitler to dismember Czechoslovakia and Munich in 1938. As I said, I speak of these conundra because the liberal order is being challenged again by authoritarian, illiberal, yet often successful market economies in ways that we did not foresee when the first semi-free elections were held in Poland 25 years ago. That, in sum, is what I want to say about external threats to liberal democracy today. And I'll turn more attention to the internal threats. Basically, I would say that due to rapid technological change, and perhaps too rapid technological change because we haven't figured out what to do with it, we have really major internal challenges as well. I have been arguing that the change that our modern digitized societies are going through is so radical that it is comparable to what we called the Industrial Revolution 150 years ago, only in that it is far more rapid and ubiquitous and nearly simultaneously. Now, the Industrial Revolution took place in, they say, the UK in the 1840s. It reached at least Estonia about 40 years later, but now it's going on all over. Everything is different and will be more so, not only in terms of how we do things, what kind of work we do, and what kind of education we need, but also in terms of how we interpret the basic concepts of liberal democracy that is to say, freedom, privacy, transparency, democracy itself, and how we think of the relationship between the public and private spheres, and just as much the, between the state and its citizens. And I would argue here, the threats may be even greater than the threats we see wherever East is from here. Internetization and the digital world has from the beginning been intimately connected with the idea of freedom. Information wants to be free was one of the slogans of the early computer pioneers who created the world we live in today. And we are more free to receive and spread information than ever before if you think about the speed at which digital information moves around the globe. And uh, since President Freiberg mentioned Radio Free Europe. That was our basic tenet, to promote the free flow of information regardless of borders. Well, we've achieved that even without Radio Free Europe. But at the same time, we also have people's concern about privacy, which have grown in proportion, and especially during the last year after the Snowden scandal broke out. We want to be free in the positive sense we want positive freedom, to use Isaiah Berlin's terms, to do everything that the modern digital technology allows us to do. But we also want to be free in a negative sense, that is, free from surveillance or excessive restrictions. Many of the di digital pioneers would prefer to be free from any rules and regulations, which is part of the ethos of the digital avant-garde but also part of the problem we are facing today. When thinker and Grateful Dead lyricist, if you know that band, John Barry Barlow addressed governments in 1996 with his declaration of the independence of the internet that said, 
I quote, your legal concepts of property, expression, identity, movement, and context do not apply to us. And he was right. Significantly, I should say, out of this, he also left privacy out of this declaration. He was more right than we bargained for. For now, the legal concepts that underpin liberal democracy truly no longer apply to us online, whoever that us may be, to you or the mafia or the government or kids under the legal age of responsibility. In the physical world, it took the Lockean idea of a social contract, it took parliaments and constitutions and laws and regulations to find a balance between things we want to be free to do and things we want to be free from being done to us. To find the justified and measured limitations to freedom so that we can be free without threatening one another, so that the state can guarantee our security without impinging too much on our liberty. In the online world, we have yet to do so. The change I'm talking about has occurred in just a few decades. The first stable link between multiple computers that could communicate through the ARPANET took place in 1969. It happened after some young geeks, now old geeks, invented the TCPIP protocol. That, that ARPANET experiment formed the basis of the internet as we know it. A civilian internet, one which is open to all of us, is barely 25 years old. The first web browser came out in 1993, 21 years ago. I remember when I was a child, I used to ask my parents, how did you live without TV? And these days, my kids go, what? You lived without the internet? Still, today, the exponential growth of the use of information technology in the internet has changed our society so much, we can no longer imagine life without it. Just imagine a time, though, with fixed-line phones, manual typewriters, with no personal computers, let alone iPads, smartphones, no apps, SMSs, no iTunes, no emails, or Google searches. I used to have to go to the library to find things out. And I had to take a bus. And I walked 15 miles to school. No, I did take a bus to go to the library. What lies ahead will change and develop even more, far more rapidly than in the past 40 or 25 years. As everything we do in our everyday lives is more and more dependent on internet-based systems, we ourselves become more and more vulnerable to cyber attacks, espionage, and cyber crime, but also to the levels of surveillance that even George Orwell could hardly imagine. Today, 1984 and Brave New World, the classic dystopian novels I read in high school that were so formative in our contemporary thinking about liberal democracies or what the opposite of a liberal democracy is, strike me as technologically naive in their assumptions. Kind of like when I remember reading the three, the three Musketeers, where the valiant heroes decide to disperse a burnt secret message, or rather, uh, yes, a burnt secret message, lest, I quote, Richelieu has figured out a way to reconstitute the ashes. Well, today we still can't reconstitute ashes, but we can reconstitute the message. Even if you delete an email from your computer, it more than likely remains on your disk drive. Surveillance of a kind described as fictional, the two-way television of 1948-1984, actually is in every modern computer, unless you tape over your PC's camera. Mobile phones or microphones that also inform others where you are at any time. Big data knows and can deduce more about you than Big Brother ever did in Orwell's novels. I would even argue that oftentimes big data can do things about you that you don't even know about yourself. And all this, even without the state, moderately clever individuals um, and, of course, companies can do all of this, leaving the whole state aside. 
So it's just that the problem is the state can do it even better than the moderately clever individuals or the companies. To deal with all that, the digital age requires a rethink of some of the basic concepts of our society, such as privacy, transparency, public-private relations. We have to think about <clears throat> the future in terms of our civil liberties and democracy. In the past year, we have seen how different in digi the, <clears throat> the digitized world can be when it comes to our most fundamental tenets about the role of the state and its relationship to the citizens. In the 1960s, Marshall McLuhan became famous for saying, we live in the global village. That he was talking about the television age. And this meant that we could see events sitting on our couch um, and in our living rooms, watching what was going on in our, li in, the, in our living rooms. We could see the Vietnam War. And this, he claimed, had changed our consciousness. But the metaphor used by McLuhan was incomplete. We could know what was happening elsewhere if the editors of the networks and democracies or the censors and illiberal societies allowed you to. However, unlike in a real village, you were still protected. You were anonymous. No one could really find out anything about you, the person watching what was going on TV. No one was looking at you was the basic idea. It was a one-way view, passive, and thus it was not a village, because villages are not passive. The in <clears throat> emergence of an internet, however, has changed this. Today, we truly live in a global village. Governments Google the apps you've downloaded on your smartphone, your credit card swipes, make you an open book, just as in a small 19th century village, such as the one my great-grandparents are from just across the Latvian border. This is an empirical truth. But consider also that in the past 150 years, hundreds of millions of people have fled the village, the shtetl, whatever you call it, to get away from the, to get away from the village where everyone knew everything about you, to start all over. And if they didn't, they not only fled the village to go to the city, they fled this village to go to the new world. Uh, some to escape poverty, some to escape small town mentality, where everyone knew everything about you. These are the basis of the Bildungs Romans of the first half of the past century. Every modern society has a whole range of literature about people talking about escaping the, the closed villages they live in or their small towns to go on to bigger things. I wonder if someday we will be reading Bildungs Roman about, written about the internet age. There no longer will be, however, in this case, such a thing as a clean start. You will always be investigable. I mean, you could apply one of these, uh, for, ask Google to erase, uh, according to the right to be forgotten law, mentions of you in your country but that doesn't apply to Lithuania or Estonia, so forget it. So it's not gonna happen. And even if you're forgotten in the United States, which you can do if you're in the United States, there's still going to be articles written about you in Latvia. So you can't get away from it. So no more clean start. You will also always be investigable. Just a few keystrokes and everyone will know everything they might want to know about you. And I'm not talking about a government agency. It's just anybody. This will have and already has had profound implications for what we consider liberal democracy and privacy, two fundamental elements of the Enlightenment era or to come out of the Enlightenment era. We could describe the state of affairs using Thomas Hobbes's characterization of the anarchy of life in the state of nature, which he described as a war of all against all, where there are no rules, where might makes right. No one is protected. Anyone can access your privacy. I should also say this is just a metaphor. I'm not calling the digital world yet an anarchy in the state of nature. If you want to see what Hobbes meant about anarchy in the state of Europe, it's better to look what's happening in Sloyansk. But to solve this metaphorical problem of a war again, of all against all, 
Hobbes posed or posited a sovereign, a dictator, to provide order, to impose order. If we look around today in democratic countries, this is precisely the solution sought by so many authoritarian countries, as solutions to the problem of the freedom offered by the internet. They want a ruling sovereign to control the technology like any threat of any free spirit rising. Thus, we see attempts in the world to regulate, control, and Westphalianize the net. Uh, and I say Westphalianize here because some governments, um, what some governments really want is to accept that each government will be allowed to regulate its own internet along the same principles as the 1648 Treaty of Westphalia. And I should say here, I say that also because one of the most insulting terms I can think of is the balkanization of the, of the internet. I mean, we from the Baltics are already annoyed enough by the use of, of sort of epithets applied to geographical reasons, regions. I really don't think that balkanize is a very neutral term, so let's not ever say balkanize when we talk about the internet. Let's talk about Westphalianization, and besides, you'll look more educated. Um, but in any case, governments do want to Westphalianize the uh, the internet and they would each one would control their what is in their own country and Snowden of course has added to this um, even before the Snowden revelations a year ago um, the ITU which is a sub organ of the UN was pushing to impose an intergovernmental control on the internet so that different countries would be able to actually control what goes on there in the internet in their own countries um, the liberal democracies, mainly from Europe and the United States, but also Japan and Australia and New Zealand, pushed back on this and uh, in a sense we had a victory in, in December of 2012 that the ITU failed to take over the administration of the internet. But after Snowden, this all came back with a vengeance and so a number of, multi, a number of authoritarian and re, repressive regimes are rubbing their hands with glee because this will give them the, the, the opportunity to replace the current multi-stakeholder model of internet uh, governance. Uh, today, um, the other thing you want to replace is, the, is ICANN, which is still partially controlled by the United States. But frankly, when we think about, again, these issues, do we really want an organization uh, strongly dominated by, uh, by authoritarian regimes controlling in an intergovernmental body what is on the internet? I don't. Now, in free societies, we rely on John Locke's solution to the state of nature by positing a contract between the government and the people. This contract in modern democracies underpins all of our relationships between the citizen and his or her government. The Lockean contract has been tested and retested and refined in practice and in theory. The Peter Zenger trial, Voltaire, the Federalist Papers, Thomas Paine, John Stuart Mill, and of course with refinements by Isaiah Berlin in two concepts of liberty and by countless other people. The problem we face today, ranging from child pornography to government surveillance on the internet, is to indeed private surveillance, that is by private individuals, to corporate use and abuse of our online searches, is that we do not have a Lockean social contract to figure out what our relationship should be to each other and to the internet, I mean to, the, to our government, in the digital sphere on the internet. So thus today, we're again in the midst of a massive debate on what liberal democracies can, should, and should not do with the extremely powerful technologies that we possess. We don't have the answers yet, and we reject the solutions of undemocratic society. So basically what we need today is our lock, 
our internet, our digital lock, our digital Voltaire, our Jefferson, and our Berlin for the digital age. Concepts such as privacy, confidentiality, and freedom of speech, especially anonymous, anonymous speech, have been refined or through technology have re redefined themselves. So we're faced with new questions such as, do fundamental concepts such as what constitutes a reasonable search and seizure apply to bits and bytes? Is a DDoS attack that is overwhelming a, a server with huge amounts of pings, does that, is that a legitimate form of social protest? What is identity when, to recall a famous New Yorker cartoon, on the internet no one knows you're a dog? If you recall this, as a great cartoon, two dogs sitting there with a computer screen and one says to the other, on the internet no one knows you're a dog. I would argue that's the fundamental issue of identity on the internet, but that's a different topic. Who owns the data created each time you make a credit card swipe or you log on your on your log on your smartphone your morning push-ups if you bother to do them or your driving route that is passively recorded by your mobile all the mobile uh, telephone transmission towers on the way what happens when you enter a bus and someone wears google glasses that recognize you uh, this has not happened much yet, but I predict in a few years a lot of people have broken noses. And what do we do with those people who have been punched in the face because they're wearing a Google glasses in the bus because someone gets offended? Who's at fault? How about authoritarian societies where none of the democratic rights and freedoms we are used to apply? Where the ability to restrict and modify and distort information is being taken to new and unprecedented levels as we see every day on the internet if you look at the Russian medium. Where virtual reality has assumed a completely new meaning from what it was 10 years ago. Even our positive values are beginning to clash. And not just in the digital sphere, though exacerbated by the possibilities of digital capabilities. Take two cherished concepts of the modern era, privacy, which I've been talking about, and openness or transparency. I'm going to give you a slightly longer example to understand the problems that we have to start grappling with. In Estonia and a number of other countries in Northern Europe, we tend to believe that how public money is spent should be public knowledge. I mean, that's the whole bit about transparency, right? That sounds good just like privacy sounds good. We also know from the EU's seven-year budget, which is all that is, and we know that it is almost a trillion euros, just slightly under 900 something billion euros, and roughly 40%, almost 40, 400 billion euros uh, in this financial period goes to agriculture. But until a few years ago, who got what was secret? No one knew, or no one was allowed to know. And then our commissioner, Sim Kallas, uh, pushed through a reform to the EU to publish who received those funds, uh, which led to the discrediting of all kinds of cherished myths. Because it turned out that despite what we've been told for all these decades, um, that most of the money of the EU in the common agricultural policy did not go, as was maintained, or as was said, to maintain the traditional ways of rural life, where the farmer milking by hand his goat would make handcrafted cheese, and the only way to keep this going was to give massive support to the, to the farmer milking the goat. Well, it turns out that, in fact, virtually all of the money with a few exceptions, goes to agribusiness, not to making handmade cheese. Uh, this is rather embarrassing. So a number of the countries uh, that got the most, obviously, took the commission to court, claiming that publishing who got how much of public monies violated agribusiness's privacy. And they won the case. 
And now, once again, we don't know where 400 billion euros go, except for the five countries, Estonia among them, that voluntarily publish the names and the figures of who gets the cap funds from their country. So who is right? The transparency or the privacy advocates? Which is the greater good? We haven't reached a European consensus. And moreover, as we've seen, these views change over time. Yesterday's privacy as an ultimate good may turn out to be today's transparency as the ultimate good. These are all questions I shan't, and in most cases, can't answer. And I could go on posing them. But I mention even just these to point out that many of the self-evident truths underlying liberal democracy must be reinterpreted in the internet age. Because the literally fantastic level, the new technological opportunities to follow people, to see what they're doing, uh, in this age, it is especially the concept of privacy that has to be reformulated. First, we have to make clear which aspects of privacy violations we can fear, which aspects of privacy violations we can't fear. And this will be a difficult and delicate task. I believe personally that we should know where public monies go. On the other hand, I don't really think it sh people should know what they do within the four walls of their homes. The damage done by the Snowden revelations, or more accurately, their journalistic interpretations, which often are sensationalistic, as well as public perceptions based on these often sensationalist accounts, has been immense. The intervening year has forced us to reevaluate re virtually everything we know and think about the cyber world. This reevaluation re has not always produced the most desirable outcomes. At the level of our citizens, we have seen a dramatic increase in paranoia about what goes on in the web. In terms of NATO and relations among democracies, transatlantic as well as intra as well as intra-European, these relations have relations have all suffered enormous damage. Our hopes for cloud computing, e-services such as e-medicine have also been dashed in many cases. We see pushes for the autarkization and isolation of national webs. Authoritarian regimes are gleeful, democracies are frustrated. Freedom online is under threat more than ever. It seems that the gap between the attitude of, of the cyber pros or professionals and ord ordinary web users is growing. Until last year, anyone in the field, uh, who was actually in the field professionally, knew about the fragility of privacy online. But the general public did not. Now we see assumptions about the lack of privacy everywhere, even when we know that technologically, say for example in the case of what are called deep packet inspections, that's what allows people to read your emails actually, the amount of resources required to engage in this means that most people can continue to write and send their innermost thoughts, no matter how perverse, without worrying about a reader over their shoulder or reading what they're writing. However, the paranoia about privacy means we have entered a Pinchonian mindset where we worry that every last corner of our lives is being monitored somewhere by someone, an anonymous them. Or they. In many innocuous, fundamentally commercial cases, our Google searches, our Facebook likes, this may even be true, but it feels nonetheless noxious. Yet while most of the public has become obsessed with privacy for good reason, others do not fully understand the need of, for some kind of social contract to protect people's privacy. If up till last year it was difficult to get policymakers interested in cyber issues, then today we often have the opposite problem, getting people in the cyber world to accept the constraints of democratic practice and notions of privacy in the free world. Personally, I'm almost done.
they can wake up. Personally, I think that the problem we face represents the culmination of a problem diagnosed 55 years ago by C.P. Snow in his essay, The Two Cultures. The absence of a dialogue between the scientific, technological, and the humanist traditions. Snow was a rarity. He was a respected scientist as well as a well-known poet who noted that he could talk to his colleagues in either realm, but they couldn't talk to each other. He could talk to his biologist friends, and they all understood what he said. He could talk to his poet's friends, and they all understood what he said. But his biologist friends couldn't talk to his poet friends. Today, this problem of the late 50s Oxford faculty clubs permeate, I would argue, all of our lives. Bereft of understanding of fundamental issues and writings in the development of liberal democracy, fundamental rights and freedoms, computer geeks devise ever better ways to track people simply because they can. Or, isn't this cool? I just figured out how to do this and find that out about them. Humanists, politicians and lawmakers, journalists, lawyers and poets, on the other hand, do not understand even the fundamentals of the underlying technology or the math and are convinced, for example, that tracking metadata means the government reads your mails. C.P. Snow's two cultures today not only do not talk to each other, they simply act as if the other doesn't exist. And it is imperative, I think, that we bridge this gap not only for the future of democracy in the digital age, but also for a humanist future. While all this is going on around us, we must not lose our fundamentals, the foundations of modern civilized life in liberal democracies, that is respect for human rights, the rule of law, free and fair elections. These are the fruits of the non-technical revolution of the past 300 years in the West from the original ideas of the Enlightenment to universal suffrage to the civil rights movement in the U.S., the struggle of dissidents in the USSR and other totalitarian and authoritarian societies. Living in the new digital global age, or village, sorry, means that we need to be aware that we can no longer expect any privacy and where we need to protect the privacy and we need to protect privacy more vigilantly than before the digital revolution. Whether we are worried or not, we must admit that we have entered a brave new world where we have not figured out the new rules, where we are only beginning to grapple with what it means to be a liberal democracy in the digital age that we have imperceptibly and, well, just quickly without really noticing entered. While trying to figure this out, we must remember that privacy and security are not the opposite of freedom. Indeed, attempts to limit freedom online, allegedly in the name of privacy and security, that <clears throat> you know of, in the end, serve none of those essential properties. Ultimately, what we need is to find a balance between security, privacy, and the free flow of information. In fact, that was exactly what John Locke attempted to do 300 years ago and that the like of Mill and Berlin went on to fine tune. We need transparency and openness to create trust between governments and citizens and the private sector. And we need to address concepts such as privacy, confidentiality, and freedom of speech, especially anonymous speech, all in a new way because they all have been redefined and indeed um, though tech, tech, through technology have redefined themselves. It is worth the effort because if you can for, enforce the rule of law in the digital world, there is no end to what we can actually, positive that we can do. We have to realize that what we thought of as privacy and as freedom has changed and will change more and that we need the philosophy and the laws for the digital age that will make sure that just as democracies have done in the physical world during the last few centuries, that the new positive liberties to do endless things that we can on in, the, in digitally, that, the modern, that these modern technologies enable us to do will not be abused or will not come to, at an unbearable cost to negative liberties, to 
to our sense of privacy and personal freedom. That's the task we face. And I hope our young people today, I'm 60, I hope the young people here today figure it out because we're not doing a good job of it. Thank you very much. fabulous chance of asking, uh, oh, I see a hand already up there, I'll of just asking questions. Already. He's always the first person with the question. Of asking President Dilvis questions. And I think um, we have two microphones here, so uh, please speak into the microphones. We have a simultaneous translation, and we we're, uh, do it that way. So maybe we'll take three three questions at a time, that's always better. Um, and I see one here. Is there another hand arising? One here, and one way over there, right? So we start over here. Thank you, Mr. President. Now, I have a question. In Latvia, I'm an MP now, you know, in Latvia, we're working on the idea of voting, through, of voting electronically through the internet, which you already have in Estonia. But listening to you, it means that uh, we, somebody in Estonia or elsewhere in the world knows how everybody votes, unless they tape over the camera in the computer. Can you please comment on that? Thank you, Abdis. Uh, one here from Robert. Robert Cottrell. Uh, Mr. President, it seems to me that it's a time of very fundamental change in which people aren't really sure of the value of their privacy. And at the moment they seem inclined to sell it very cheaply for essentially trivial services. Now, I, I fear the loss of my privacy, but I find it very hard to rationalize that except by appeal to instinct. So my question is, what sort of intrinsic value do you see in privacy? How would you explain its value to somebody who doesn't seem to understand it? I think we'll take the third question uh, in the next, because these are two large questions and we'll do that. President Dilvis? Okay, on the first question, well, I mean, certainly technically, I mean, there's the Here's your screen, here's your camera, you don't see what I'm doing. Um, but in fact, the, more fundamentally, what you do need to have is a unique identity online that, um, that allows you to have secure, a very secure communication, unless you have the unique identity, which includes basically very strong encryption, uh, things don't work. I mean, most people in the world seem to operate on the principle of the credit card, which you just put in your number, you, and then they ask you for a three-digit CVC security code to turn around and put in three digits, and you think you're secure. I think people who do that are nuts. Uh, you actually do need very strong encryption using a binary key or a public key infrastructure. Um, I tape my phone over, my, my computer over, as do many people. It's probably a good advice. Um, and the, of course, you know, ultimately there is an element of trust that comes in. You have, this is the same kind of trust you have when you go vote with paper. How do you know that when they're counting the votes there that they're not going to sort of do what they do in some countries that we all know and love, you know, sort of shift packages, packets from one set to another and throw some out and so forth. Uh, I mean, there is an element of trust that comes in, but in terms of at least the secure communication side, that is what should guarantee anonymity. Now, on the idea of privacy and what it is, I would say, this is as I'm afraid, I could get to it very long, but basically the idea of privacy or privacy, depending on where you're from, 
developed in the Anglo-Saxon world uh, to, uh, from an essay, later a court decision by Louis Brandeis, uh, saying that challenging the traditional Anglo-Saxon view of privacy as property and that there were things beyond property. Uh, this all came about when his good friends uh, in 1890 or so was, had a, his daughter at a wedding and then a yellow newspaper wrote about it. And he was so incensed he wrote this essay. Uh, the, the fears of violation of privacy, I think, in sort of continental views comes more from the abuse that we have seen by states. I mean, in one case it was the press here in Europe Continental Europe, it was more uh, the various, you know, NKVDs, Gestapo, Stasis, and all those things that uh, to, that people were worried about. I would say that in the digital world, we we might even make sense. It may even make sense to go back to the pre-Brandeis view of privacy um, as a property issue. Because, in fact, in the digital age, um, where we see everything being monetized, data being monetized, your personal actions monetized digitally, we should, um, maybe, perhaps we could see that, well, I mean, if you're going to do that to me, you're going to steal those data from me. I'm going to sue you, and you're going to have to pay me for it. In Estonia, we have a law, I think most countries in the EU have it, but it's not enforced very much, that the citizen is the owner of the data on him or her. And this is a very important principle for our e-governance system, that you actually can see whoever has accessed your data. I mean, my data are accessed all the time by all the journalists. Um, but when we go go beyond that, you know that um, you know, there are all kinds of amazing cases that uh, that have come up with what you can do in looking at people's data. I would I recommend a book by his last name is Maya Schoenberger. It's called Big Data. That has a, a, just an amazing set of cases of what can be done today looking at data. And some of them is, some of them are quite awful. Uh, but I think if we move back to the idea that, uh, that privacy is property, it's just since the property is now dig in digital form, just as you pay to download an iTunes record or whatever, MP3, then you are owed money for downloading information on you. The other thing with privacy, which I didn't get into because it would get too abstract, but I actually don't think privacy is the real problem. Uh, the real problem is going to be integrity. And to put it bluntly, or to put it very simply, though it's a far more complex issue, um, data, I mean, privacy is someone looking at your medical records and seeing what your blood type is and your RH positive, say. Uh, integrity is, <laughs> or a violation of integrity is not when someone looks at your data, but they change it. And your data are changed from RH positive to RH negative, and then you get sick. Data integrity is actually the cause of much of what we consider the sort of fundamental failures or attacks in the digital world. Um, Stuxnet was not a worm that I mean, they did bad things to the computer. All it did was it changed the data that was going into the centrifuges that the Iranians were operating. And since the data were crazy, I mean, this is the data integrity issue. The data were crazy. This, this, these, uh, what was spinning, I mean, the centrifuges, uh, controlled by computers, that program worked fine. It just didn't know what to do with all these created crazy data bits coming in. And so data integrity is one of the, is, is something we should pay far more attention to. Or just think of banks, right? Okay, even a blood type, think banks. Someone knows how much money you make, big deal. Someone goes and changes what's in your bank account. That's a big deal. Um, you know, malware, in those terms, you wipe out a bank's 
but much better is you know, increase your bank account by a lot. Decrease someone else's bank account by a lot. Um, and those are the kinds of issues I think we've been blinded to somewhat by the uh, Snowden case, because everyone's more worried about having their secret letters being read by somebody. I, which I don't denigrate, I'm just saying that it, the, the issues can be much bigger. Thank you. Uh, we had one question over there and a second one here. So let's start over there. Yes, I wanted to talk about the Snowden revelations here. <laughs> wait, wait. wait oh, okay, up. I'm going to stand up. Um, essentially, that's what the other side says, right? That he has done immense damage that we cannot even comprehend. When you say other side, you've defined yourself. <laughs> um, I would say that I'm, I don't think everything he did is great, and, but I think that it is good to the extent that it brought government's actions to, to be accountable because we didn't know, well, those who are part of the public did not know about this. And I, that's, that's what I wanted to ask. Whether, um, whether we, like, they say, oh, well, we cannot talk about this because it's very secretive and he has given secret information to say, uh, to let's say the Russians, or whether it's just an excuse for government to keep expanding its authority. Because once you have the temptation to, uh, to use the power you have, you have the temptation to use the power that you sort of have the ability to abuse. I hope you understood. Yeah. Well, let me say, what, first of all, it's, Snowden is only a problem if you live in a liberal democracy. Right? It's not a problem. I mean, we're not really concerned. I mean, we're not surprised. We're not surprised by this organization called SORM, which is over there, wherever the East is, that has far better capabilities, and, and where in Russia every ISP or internet service provider, they have to go through the FSB. So, I mean, the difference is that in our societies we're going, oh my God, they're doing this, or could be doing this, whereas, I mean, it's not as if this is a big brownie point for the East, because they do it a priori. Uh, okay, now, when it comes, I mean, I, I, it's really hard for me to have a position on this because I don't know the facts. I do, I mean, all I know is that, I mean, basically we're told that 100,000, 200,000 uh, files have been stolen, yet what's been published are about 11. And those 11, in, in fact, are probably quite embarrassing to the United States. Uh, but I'm not sure that the remaining files are necessarily embarrassing or per, uh, to the United States, maybe they're dangerous for all of us that they have been stolen. So I, it's hard for me to say. I mean, uh, uh, the capabilities, uh, I also said in my speech, the capabilities have been widely, wildly exaggerated. Much of what goes on is analysis of metadata. Who is talking or connected to whom? Why that should be that upsetting, I'm not sure, because in fact, if you use a public good, say a highway, should you be surprised that uh, speeding cameras note where you are? Um, they may not know what, I mean, they're not, they don't know what you're saying when you're driving your car, but they do know that you have gone from one point to another. That's just part of the price of driving a highway that has been paid for by citizens. So too with the internet, the fact that you're looking at one person is talking, you see that these two people talk to each other. I mean, it's a source of, it's a data bit. It's not, is it really violating your privacy if you're using a public good to do it? I'm not sure. Looking at what you say, that is probably something that most people would find offensive. But again, I'm not sure that there's, I mean, well, not, I'm not sure. I mean, I'm sure that this kind of belief that, as I said, you know, I'm sitting in my little farm in Estonia and I'm writing something that, well, I don't want anyone to see because actually it's very private and personal. I really don't think they're looking for that because the amount of computing time and effort that, is, that you need in order to do what is called 
the technical name is a deep packet inspection. It's going into what is the content of the mail is immense and huge. And I can see them maybe wanting to do it to someone who, for some reason, keeps looking at, uh, uh, at Google searches on explosives. You might want to say what he's writing about. But I, on the other hand, other issues, I'm not so sure. Um, well, Celia Pinch. Uh, thank you. A very practical short question. How should the OSCE handle the Russian Federation now? <laughs> well, it's not doing a great job. <laughs> I mean, there are, uh, there, are two, uh, there are two observer missions of four persons each, not including translators, that are being held by, uh, by the rebels, terrorists, whatever you want to call them, in uh, eastern Ukraine. And the OSC has not had much, effort, much success in uh, actually convincing anyone to do anything about it. And uh, we are quite concerned about one, uh, one observer mission has been theirs or has been basically missing and held hostage for almost 10 days. No other one for a few days less. Um, the OSC is not really very effective. And as I said, when the fundamental tenets with the whole sort of security architecture, which we built based on the OSC, which is kind of based that we all sit down and agree not to do things if they're violating that, then it's not clear what, what good it is. I mean, not, not, people don't like changing things, and they don't like to admit that certain things don't work anymore. Uh, but, uh, well, I mean, it's not only the OSC. I mean, we see all kinds of things. There's the ICBM treaty seems to be violated. Do you say we trash that treaty because we have a treaty, but the other side is violating? I don't know. I mean, and that's one of the conundrums we face is that... Uh, how do we, I mean, it's precisely the conundrums that we sort of have this belief that we have an agreement and you follow it, and now we're saying, well, they're not following it. But no one really wants to say, well, let's just throw it out into the garbage, because it is garbage, but unfortunately, people don't want to do much with the fact that it's garbage, because then they have to start all over and say, hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil. <laughs> right? I mean, that's what we're doing. We're continuing. We're continuing in, with the OSC, CSE, when in fact the founding act no longer applies. A few more questions. I see one there and one here. And let's start over there. Uh, you've given a very succinct summary of what you see as the internal and external threats to today's liberal democracy. Uh, what I want is your opinion on whether or not in the sum these constitute an existential threat at all. Are the compromises we're going to have to make inevitably going to put the absolute founding principles at risk? I hope not. <laughs> I really hope not. Uh, but I mean, even democracy has evolved over, over uh, well certainly, I mean, modern democracy has evolved quite a bit even since the Enlightenment. Um, uh, so, and so have the ideas of rights and freedoms, and we may end up moving in a direction where, uh, well, I mean, I, I fear, my gut feeling is at one point we're going to have to make a choice, either between restrictions on rights or restrictions on technology, one or the other, because the technology will become so great. Um, I mean, we're not, you know, what I say about not being really able to read most people's mails, I mean, that's sort of as a metaphor. What, what, I mean, the technology, if it happens in five years, 10 years, or 30 years, when we get to quantum computing, that ceases to be an issue, and anything can be processed. At which point, all of this encryption, all of these ideas that we have up till now, will just disappear with, with quantum computing, and everything will be completely and utterly transparent. Well, I mean, that, that day is going to come. Uh, how are we going to live with that? It's hard for me to say. Uh, 
we, as I said, you may make a compromise with the fundamental tenets of privacy as we know it today, or we will ban <laughs> quantum computing. So one or the other will, I, my gut feeling says one or the other way, one or the other will give or have to be tempered. Um, the microphone's coming. Okay, thank you, Mr. President, for your speech. I have a question related to uh, the recent events which are taking place in Crimea, in Russia, in the Baltics, and uh, we all notice that there is a lot of psychological warfare and propaganda taking place. So uh, what's in your opinion should be the way how the Western governments, uh, you know, based on uh, liberal democracy values should react on this propaganda? I mean, should the broadcasting be banned, limited, or just, you know, the government should ignore? This is one question. And the second question from, from the first one is, um, you mentioned in your speech that uh, you know the Russian minorities in the Baltics they are supporting uh, the Kremlin policy. In no, I, did, I didn't say that. Yeah, but I didn't. I said 80 percent of Russians in Russia support the annexation of Crimea. Okay, but still, I mean, there are also a lot of support here in the Baltics. So, how the Baltic government should uh, address this issue? I mean, in terms of uh, local population. Thank you. Well, on the first case. Um, I mean, at least in Estonia, uh, there was talk about, well, maybe we should uh, ban the Russian television station. I said, no way. I cannot in any way su support the, any restrictions on any free flow of information. I don't think a liberal democracy can do that, no matter what. So that's my answer for that. Now, on... In my experience has been because of, um, you know, we have this great, we have this great town in Estonia called Narva. Uh, it's great because it's kind of, uh, it's the Mecca to the Medina of Tallinn because everyone flies to Medina, everyone flies to Tallinn, but all journalists go out to Narva. Narva is on the, I mean, the city of Narva is on the Narva River, and which curves. And it's this historical city that has on the one side, if you stand in Estonia, you get this great picture. On one side is a fort, a castle built by Charles XII, representing the Lutheran Western civilization. And on the other side of the river is a fort based, built by Ivan the Terrible in a completely different style. And all these journalists come there and they say, this is Huntington writ large or writ small. And then they go and ask people, wow, do you want to join Russia? And they say, well, we support Crimea, but do you want to go to, do you want to join Russia? What are you, nuts? Uh, I mean, give up the euro for the ruble, which is plunging in value. Have free movement of labor to Siberia. Uh, have to apply to a visa, for a visa to go to even Estonia. I can't work anywhere in the EU if, I, if I'm part of Russia. And so you end up with this kind of odd mix. I mean, there are many, many articles about this by precisely these journalists who go to their Mecca to look at Narva and want to find a reconfirmation of Huntington. Uh, the, the Russians in Estonia basically agree with Russia's policy, but they don't want it instituted in Estonia, right? I mean, that's kind of a paradox, though in many ways it's completely understandable. They like the idea of a strong, powerful Russia that can do things and big, strong. But let it be over there, because I want to be in the European Union and I'd like to go to Paris and work there for a while. I mean, <laughs> that's the way it is. One more question, or if not, we can drink wine. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Igor Vatolin, journalist. I have a question uh, on perhaps first part of your uh, speech. Uh, it is on um, communication. So if in the framework of democracy you uh, see your opponent uh, who is quite different from you and then you want to understand him 
and in a dialogue with him you have uh, progress in your own position. But if your opponent denies this infrastructure of free speech, of dialogue, and wants to just take it off, destroy, explode, then what, uh, what is European democratic answer to such opponent? Well, I mean, I basically think, I mean, let him say what he wants. I mean, I don't have to listen to him, right? I mean, no. go ahead, talk. I mean, but I, I just don't think, uh, I don't think you can have restrictions on freedom of speech in any way, if that's what you're talking about. I just don't see it, I mean, personally. Uh, you know, I mean, I realize sometimes you hear people say all kinds of unpleasant things about me, about my country, some of their complete and utter lies. But the idea that I would want to restrict that is completely abhorrent to me. Maybe to some other people it's not abhorrent, but to me it is. I can go now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, President Davis. By these <laughs> and I'd also like to thank our patron, uh, Dr. Weirwitz Freiberg, who's been true to us from the first Isaiah uh, Berlin Day back in 2009. Um, the Isaiah Berlin uh, Association and the Soros Foundation Latvia thank the European Commission representation in Riga for their generous financial support. Our media partners Satori, Delphi, and Politica.lv, uh, the Latvian Debate Association, and Satori for their audio shower installation. As well, I'd like to inform you that the Foundation has provided an e-version of the translation into Latvian of Berlin's Four Essays on Liberty, and it's available at the website, which you see up here. I believe it's up there somewhere. Maybe it isn't. <laughs> but it's isaiahberlin.org. And they're for free. And, and please, please read. Um, I now invite you to join us all for a glass of wine and canapes. And we look forward to seeing you all again next year, uh, when it will be the 106th birthday of Sir Isaiah Berlin. Thank you. Thank you.